So everyone maybe join me do three prostrations, those who are Buddhist. Yeah, again, a heartfelt welcome here today in the Suklakang of Damamati. Um, we have many uh, Dharma students from different Buddhist groups here today. We have representatives of the German um, Buddhist Union. So we are, I think, a bit of a mixed crowd here today. Uh, the name of the center is Dharma Mati in uh, Tibetan Shukilodro. In German, Sagar Rinpoche translated it as Heart of Wisdom. So now um, you are here today. Um, thank you very much for coming and taking the courage to address our favorite topic today. <laughs> <laughs> taking refuge in generating bodhicitta. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, I take refuge until I attain enlightenment through the merit of practicing generosity and so on. May I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. In the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, I take refuge until I attain enlightenment through the merit of practicing generosity and so on. May I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. In the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, I take refuge until I attain enlightenment through the merit of practicing generosity and so on. May I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. By the power and the truth of this practice, may all sentient beings enjoy happiness and the causes of happiness, be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the great happiness devoid of suffering, and may they dwell in the great equanimity that is free from attachment and aversion. The ground is purified with scented water and strewn with flowers. It is adorned with Sumeru, the king of mountains, the four quarters of the universe and the sun and the moon. Thinking of it as the blessed Buddha fields, I offer it. By the virtue of this offering, may all beings here and now attain the happiness of that pure land. Tram Guru Ratna Mandala Putsa Mega Samundra Saparana Samaya Ahu. Please turn the wheel of the Dharma, grant the teachings of the Hinayana and Mahayana to all sentient beings according to their intelligence and receptivity. <clears throat> yes, you have uh, just done requesting the requesting to turn the will of the Dharma. But um, what I'm going to do this morning, today, I don't know whether you should categorize as the will of the Dharma. It is basically uh, me just sort of, I don't know, blabbering, venting, um, expressing some, some of my views. So please um, 
I don't know, I will be kind of embarrassed to categorize this as a, as a proper teaching. But nevertheless, I'm doing this with a motivation to cl clarify, if I can, um, some of the seemingly, there seems to be um, seemingly misunderstanding, misinterpretation, partial understanding, different points of view, lots and lots of editing, and lots of, and lots of, lots of sound effect. You know, I'm a kind of a really, someone called me zero grade filmmaker, you know. <clears throat> so, <laughs> nevertheless, I know the art of, I know a little bit about editing, and a little bit of, you know, things you can do with the sound and editing and, you know, and changes a lot of meaning. And um, this is primarily the reason why I'm here uh, to really try to clarify um, this. I, I hope I, I, I can do this. Uh, that's my aspiration. Uh, I don't expect that this will do the job totally. In fact, I'm afraid no matter what I say, it's going to be heard, interpreted, quoted uh, by different people in different angle. I have sort of noticed this recently. Um, I have written 19 pages uh, thinking that needs explanation, needs a, you know, clear, thorough explanation. Of course, people don't seem to have much uh, patience to even, you can tell, uh, didn't even have patience to go beyond maybe a page or two. Um, but still made comments. But then, a few months later, I made one, I posted two words, I uh, think, on, on my Facebook, and that also got misinterpreted. <laughs> so, you know, what can I do? Uh, say a lot of things, you get misinterpreted, you get quoted this way, that way. Say a few words, uh, you got caught it, but, you know, that's how it is. Um, <clears throat> that's how the world is run. You know, many of you, those who are Buddhist, you know, you have received teachings such as Madhya Mika Avatara, where Chandrakirti said, you know, every, not, not just Chandrakirti, everyone, many, many great masters of the past have said, everything's your projection. There's a lot of, pro projection is the only thing that we have. Just recently I was watching CNN interviewing some staunch Trump supporter, three of them. And suddenly I realized the Trump, the anti-Trump people basically are those who have time to do yoga, those who have time to read things like Guardian, Dostoyevsky, poetry, I don't know. Uh, those who have time to come to the Dharma centers, those are basically people, and they have their projection. And these three guys who are like, they have a totally different projection. It really threw me off. I mean, I can't understand why they can't see through. But, you know, that's their projection. So, but I want to repeat this again and again. My primary reason here, yes, we have an, we have an issue. I'm not going to pretend there's, you know, nothing, nothing is happening. 
there is an issue, there is a problem. Um, but my main reason here is to really clarify some of the interpretation of the Vajrayana and its philosophy. That has always been my sort of aim, if you like. Even the time when I was writing my 19 pages. And by the way, when I was writing the 19 pages, I took some time and I did, you know, I put some effort. You know, there was a lot of good matches I have missed writing those. So I have, to <laughs> I have to say, you know, I did my best with my good intention. Uh, but that also got uh, heavily uh, interpreted as if I don't care about alleged victims. And this is not true. Of course, I care. And I care beyond normal sort of, what do you call it, like emotionally, emotional hurt, physical hurt. You know, I'm, I care for the enlightened, uh, the seed of the path of enlightenment of these people. I care for their continuous, you know, spiritual path. I care due to this I situation, how many people have suddenly doubted Buddha Dharma in general, especially Vajrayana. And that really, you know, that, that's, you know, I care so much. By caring, you just don't want to just lend your shoulder to c cry upon and, you know, pad and, you know, so write a few things. You want to do something more. You want to really go to the root of why this is happening. This is no point of just like what sound, what do you call it? Sound bite. You know, everybody sort of say the same thing just because it's a, a good thing to do, like a candle vigils and something like that. You know, you have to really try to tackle the issue. And by the way, talking about tackling the issue, I also thought when the organization here invited me to come here, usually, as you, many of you may know, I don't go to many different centers and teach and, you know, do these public events. I, you know, I'm not so fond of this because, I don't know, I, it's, 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 um, just, it's just not, not in me, so to speak. But I, when I received the invitation, the first thought was, this is a good chance. People are now paying attention. You know what the issue that has been raised, the disappointment, the hurt, whatever that is being raised, I, I don't know whether you will understand what I'm going to say. This alone shows that how much the West really have come inside the Vajrayana. People actually, that shows that people do care. People, so here I find this is a really a good chance where we can actually talk this. Maybe people, okay, as I said earlier, you know, people may end up misinterpreting again and again. I'm sure very much from tomorrow I will be already quoted. And you know, it's difficult also for me to express everything within two hours is very difficult. <clears throat> but this is an opportunity to discuss. It's a such a, you know, humi human beings, we have to learn through mistakes. And there is a lots of mistakes. Yes, and we, I'm tr I will try to cover some of the uh, misinterpretations and um, also I have received so many questions which um, I can't really go through all of them, 
but I'll try to cover as much as possible. Um, So, so here, this time, I think the topic is um, Vajrayana Buddhism in the modern world, the challenges of maintaining an authentic tradition. And what is unique about the Vajrayana tradition, okay, uh, Vajrayana Buddhism in the modern world. This is good. We need to discuss this one. Maybe I'm blind. But to me, generally Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhism, and most especially Vajrayana Buddhism, is almost like a custom made for the modern people. What is modern? I was looking at the definition of Modern, this morning. How do you spell modern? M O D E R N. No. Ahead of the times. Okay, forget Vajrayana a little bit. Let's talk about Mahayana. You know, we talk about gender issue these days. Have you ever read a sutra called Vimalakirti Sutra? I don't know, I'm, I'm asking people to do some research because, you know, myself, I'm not so good at doing research, academics. I could safely say probably the Vimalakirti Sutra may be the first ever teaching of the Sutra, or I don't know, discussions about gender issue. If you can paste, you know. All these things gets, I don't know, overlooked. Now, Vajrayana, I've recently just finished doing a big ceremony and every day at the end of the day, our prayer, part of the, our prayer is, may I never reborn as a man. This is, we are talking about the Vajrayana practice. I'm talking about Buddhi uh, Vajrayana Buddhism in the modern world. If there is one system that is adaptable to the modern thinking, it has to be Vajrayana. This is how I think. Probably I'm blind. We can discuss this. <coughs> But you have to realize also, Vajrayana is not the only teaching that is available. There is um, roughly 83,999 other 
that you can choose. This is not the only path you have to choose. And also, what you need to realize is um, so many of the Buddha's teachings, there is a lot of paradoxy. Often you will find seemingly contradictions. What is taught in this sutra is different from this sutra, so on and so forth. And this, by the way, is never seen as a something to be embarrassing. For a Buddhist, they see this as a amazing, wonderful, this paradoxes. And I use this, I have used this example. There are teachings where Buddha taught. A lot of his teachings, he did not even really meant it. I call it Cinderella teachings. <laughs> and why do I call them? Because if your baby is not sleeping, and the baby needs to sleep, what do you do? You tell stories. Why? Because sleep is important. If the babies don't sleep, then both mother and maybe the baby will get sick. So you tell stories. There are so many teachings like that. There are teachings that, are, that he taught that re he really meant it. Such as Bhajajedika Sutra. Okay, to give you the example of, for the for the teachings where he did not really meant it is like a Jataka, Jataka Mala Sutra. Probably I should express, uh, explain this a little bit more. What are the teachings that he taught which he did not really mean it? Very briefly I will tell you. Everything that seems to have distinctions of samsara, nirvana, karma, reincarnation, all of this is a Cinderella teaching. It is. Even concepts like, oh, I'm a deluded being. There's an ignorance to be abandoned. There's an enlightenment to be obtained, so on and so forth. All Cinderella teachings. And we are very proud that it is a Cinderella teachings. Where Buddha taught, such as in the Vajrajedika Sutra, where he said, what is enlightenment? There is no such thing as enlightenment. There is no such thing as self. There is no such thing as obtain. There is no such thing as abandonment. You know, so on. You know, even the you know, Zen masters, they even, call, they even dramatize this by saying, if you s meet a Buddha in the street, you kill him. Ah, he meant it, those teachings. You see? So how the teachings actually are diverse and they are necessary, just as I give you the example of the baby. You have to have that. So, you know how we human beings are. We like to categorize things. So we, we categorize Buddha's teachings, sometimes based on time, such as the first vehicle, the second vehicle, the third vehicle, or three mm, pitikas, baskets. And then, you know, we define it more by saying, oh, well, where Buddha taught more the training of discipline is a Vinaya Pitaka. That's where you find things like what to do, what not to do, ethic, code of conduct, so on and so forth. And those are usually given to 
babies who have lot of desire lot of longing and lot of distractions and then but by the way even the you know even the disciples the babies they also it is not like they go through different period in the morning maybe they are desire oriented in the evening they are more aggression oriented <laughs> after the lunch they are maybe ignorant oriented you know it it fluctuates all the time but anyway where buddha taught more the training of calming the mind training the mind so on and so forth we categorize this as the basket of sutra where you know mindfulness so on and so forth is found there then where buddha dealt with the ignorance not just a gross ignorance but the most fundamental level of ignorance that is the teaching that gets categorized as the prajna the training of wisdom so that there there is a lot of this kind of categorization and one can sort of roughly say the vajrayana belongs to the the third the wisdom category but this does not mean that the vajrayana or the tantric buddhism doesn't have the mindfulness the you know the training of the mind and the you know the training of the discipline of course not it's just the emphasis now i'm still going through with this um the title vajrayana buddhism in the modern world yes even though many most of these teachings were taught 2500 years ago it is still relevant and as i said earlier vajrayana is probably is more relevant than many other teachings few reasons why modern people cherish critical thinking isn't that one of the modern what do you call it attribute there is not a single tantric text where critical thinking is condemned if you can find one i will miss one match <laughs> of one football match to you know one of these days if you can find that that's a big sacrifice for me <laughs> by the way there's not a single one critical thinking is so much emphasized in fact vajrayana is so what do you call it sophisticated in its critical thinking it's even very critical and skeptical towards things that are conventionally agreed and conventionally accepted this is where we go little bananas you understand what i'm saying because you know most of us so called critical people critical thinker thinker we are critical thinker only to the certain level anything beyond you know you could lose job if you go beyond in especially in the atmosphere of politically correctness and i don't know all kinds of things if only if you put some attention to the tantric philosophy you the the width and the depth that vajrayana 
digs and how should I put it? Uh, deconstruct through the critical thinking is just so amazing. But <clears throat> this precious wisdom of Vajrayana, but not just Vajrayana, actually, now I would say even Charvakayana. All the Buddha's teachings, but probably more so the Vajrayana teaching, um, has been hijacked, yes, hijacked by culture and tradition. And this is where fundamentally things went wrong, I think. You can observe. I use this example all the time. If I want to have a tea, you know, I want to have tea, then tea is really important. Cup not so important. Of course, it helps. You know, afternoon English tea, high tea, how the, you know, what do you call a sauce, saucer? And how the napkins are pressed or not pressed or all those things, yes, does create the atmosphere. But the tea is the most important. That's what you drink, not the cup. What happened? And what is happening, and I'm afraid this is still happening and this is still going to go on for a long time, is many people put so much emphasis on culture, tradition. And the main culprit of this is Tibetans. I mean, we are talking about Tibetan Buddhism, isn't it? But actually, after saying that, I must say, I think the Thais are doing that too. Burmese are doing that. I have recently noticed this myself. I don't know, it's just, I don't know, for some reason, the Buddhists are not so good with this. You know, okay, I come from Bhutan. I was born in Bhutan. I was born in East Bhutan. And we are talking very small. There's probably only 300,000 people who speak my language, probably less, in the whole entire world, okay? Christianity is growing there, and it is so amazing. There are East Bhutanese Christians who sing Christian hymn in Sharchokpa language. Sharchokpa language is this language that barely only less than 300,000 people speak. This is how, you know, and it's so beautiful. The hymn is so nice. And of course, people love it to sing the hymn and all of this. I'm just giving you this as an example. Whereas the Tibetans, and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, speak about this more as you know, I've made some notes based on some of the questions because, because I really want to cover as much as possible from the people's sort of curiosity. So, <clears throat> I guess you can have a little bit of a sympathy towards the Tibetans by thinking, oh, well, those people, you know, recently their culture, their very existence gets shaken up a little bit. So it's sort of understandable that they are, all they think about is their culture and their tradition. 
But the thing is, as I give you the example, Tibetan culture, Tibetan language is not Buddha Dharma. But many times, Tibetan lamas, and I am myself a culprit, I have to say, we insist others, non-Tibetans, to put them, and I have to say, I have seen this, they put more emphasis in the Tibetan culture than the Dharma. 80% Tibetan culture, 20% sort of here and there Dharma. Not good. You know why? Because no matter how much, how, how hard you try, you guys, wear Tibetan robes, eat Tibetan food, speak Tibetan language, chant Tibetan chanting, I don't know, act like a Tibetan, stick out your tongue, so on and so forth. <laughs> no matter what, how much you do, in this life, you will never ever become Tibetan. Impossible. <laughs> Impossible. But if you try to do a little bit of mindfulness for noble truth, so on and so forth, possibility to get enlightenment is much higher than becoming a Tibetan. <laughs> this is one of the fundamental mistakes. I have been talking about this, by the way, the past several years. The tantric wisdom itself is timeless. Tibetan culture is time-bound. What is now treasured as a Tibetan culture, once upon a time, it was a modern thing. Not at all important. Okay, so going back to Uh, our topic here, you know, please someone sort of align me to the topic, you know, if I get carried away by many, many other sidetracks. Um, what is the unique about Vajrayana tradition and how can it be best, how can it be, it best be practiced in the modern world? That's, what is the unique about the Vajrayana? Oh, so much, so much. How do I begin? How do I begin? Okay, let's choose one of the most politically correct and so romantically nice sounding word. Non-violence. Should we choose that? Should we talk about non-violence? <sighs> you know, non-violence is such a nice thing, isn't it? Non-violence. So let's talk about non-violence. How does Vajrayana talk about non-violence? So unique. Not fighting with your emotion is non-violence. What better way than this non-violence? Not fighting with emotion. Seeing emotion as the you know, it's like this. You have wood. You know, if you want to make a fire, and if there's a lot of wood, what do you, you know, you will, you will like famished, what do you call it? You will get so excited. Now, now we can make some good fire here. That's how, that's the attitude. Not looking down. I don't know how, we can make some word, I don't know, making friend with emotion, not looking down at emotion, not fighting with emotion, negative emotion. I think that's quite unique. I think that is really the fundamental thing, fundamental non-violence. Otherwise, Act of non-violence and believer of non-violence can be very, very violent. 
I have met many, many fanatical vegetarians. <laughs> I have met so many of these fanatical, mindful people. Fanatically constipated. <laughs> okay, talk about what is the unique about Vajrayana? Non-violence, okay? Okay. What's next? What's there's so many, so many, so many. Okay, let's choose um okay, non-violence, this very nice thing is you be talked. Now another thing. Confidence. <laughs> let's talk about confidence. Isn't that what we want? Modern world, alienation, feeling depressed, feeling useless. Everybody needs confidence. We all want to be confident. Isn't that the key? Okay, let's talk about confidence. Nowhere but only in the Vajrayana, I think. Confidence is taught intact, complete, and not only on an intellectual, philosophical, sort of something that you can read, but there is a systematic methods and, how should I say, skill on how to build that confidence. How? What is the confidence? What, what, do, we, what do we mean by confidence in the Vajrayana? Dirt is not inherent. That's the wisdom of the Vajrayana. Dirt is not inherent. Do you have a chocolate or something? Chocolate or something? Yes. I need to demonstrate this a little bit. Oh, good. It's not like mushrooms or anything like that, yeah? <laughs> so. <laughs> Dirt. But I'm confident. You know, I'm confident to do this. Do you know why? Because it's a temporary. The thing, the actual cup, inherently not in, not one with the chocolate. So, I will not worry about these Rigba people who gave a beautiful cup. Now I smeared it with the chocolate. Ah, I will not worry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will not worry because they can wash it. <laughs> and let me talk about this a little bit more because this is quite an important. This is quite an important. Because, and this is a really, really important tantric wisdom. Many times, especially if there's a lot of dirt and we have never seen the spotlessness of the cup, days after days, weeks after weeks, years after year, this thing can happen that Oh no, I will never be able to do this. You understand? But if you have the knowledge that, yeah, but you know, the cup is never become chocolate, you know? Then no matter what, you, the chocolate can be smeared here for one billion years. You can still be confident. This is the Vajrayana, this is what Vajrayana is talking about. Vajrayana is talking about you are deity. You are Buddha. You are the mandala. Your body is the mandala. Your speech is the mantra, so on and so forth. That's one of the unique quality of Vajrayana. I'm just making, you know, this, this, I'm not complete. These are very small, small 
we can, you know, if some other time maybe we can elaborate this for, you know, just on that, just on that what I just talked about, you know. Mipham Rinpoche wrote 70 pages in from all sorts of angles. No, no, he didn't, no, of course, no, he wasn't talking about the chocolate and the cup, talking about, he talked about the basic goodness of the human being and the Buddha nature and the mandala, so on and so forth. What is the unique thing about Vajrayana? Carrying on. Um, we will elaborate this a little bit, this part a little bit later, but for now, do you want? Do you want something non-dogmatic? Okay, Vajrayana is it. Really, the Vajrayana cannot, it cannot become dogmatic. Why? Very simple. Because Vajrayana says negative is positive. How can it become a dogmatic? Or neg problem is the solution and the solution is the problem. That's what the Vajrayana says. So how can it ever become dogmatic? Impossible. But as you can hear, these are, these are not that easy to I mean, it's, it's intellectually acceptable, it's intellectually understandable, I think, if you pay some attention, but habitually and emotionally very difficult to understand. You will still, today, after hearing this, you go back home and you will still condemn yourself thinking that I'm the worst guy, I'm this emotional person. Confidence, you will lose it right after this. This is a habitual pattern. That will go on if you are not practicing. I'm talking about the Vajrayana path. Okay, so a path, remember I was talking about the Sindarila path earlier? In the Sindarila path, do you know what I'm talking about, the Sindarila path? <laughs> okay, so. In the Sindarila path, Buddha made a very clear distinction between what is the problem and what is the solution. That's why it gets ca categorized as a Cinderella teachings. When these two gap become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, when the problem and the solution has no gap, that is the teaching he meant it. It comes into the category of that. And this cannot become a dogmatic. Impossible. And by the way, I don't know, maybe I'm getting scattered everywhere, but this is even reflected. This is even reflected to the, I don't know, the idols, or the, how, do you, how do you call it? I know. <laughs> Let me see. You know, okay. This is even reflected. Okay. I'll say it here. In some of his teachings, he made people shave their hair as if the hair is in, in some sort of a interference to the enlightenment or some sort of, you understand, right? monks, you know, they shave hair. On the other hand, he has also taught to, and there are people still today, 
whether they are genuine or not, we don't know. There are people who are so paranoid about losing one lock of hair, and they keep hair, yogis, you know? So, hair or no hair, both accepted. This is the beauty of the wisdom. Please, don't lose this if you are a Buddhist. So important. Also, as I was talking about the idol, you know, like if you're looking at the Thangka, the Tibetan Thangkas don't, I don't know. Anyway, Buddha has followers. There are followers like Shariputra, Ananda, is your model for this serene looking, gently walking, smiling, who says hi, <laughs> you understand, who behaves well. And we, we ven you know, we venerate them very much. They are, you know, like they are the, like the idol for the certain ethic. But have you noticed, Buddha also has Disciples, like a Manjushri, Avalokiteshvara, earrings, nose rings, probably driving limousine. Well, maybe not limousine, horse, you know, they have horse, they have elephants, they have snow lion. And there are Buddha's disciples who look strange, like Telopas, Naropas. All accepted. Do you know why? Because it is non-dogmatic path. I think it's important, these things. Carrying on with, um, what is it? Um, uniqueness of the Vajrayana. Let, a little bit more. Uniqueness. What other uniqueness of the Vajrayana? Infinite methods. There is no limit to the methods. Believe it or not, even me sipping a cup of tea, if I do it properly, and if I do it correctly, with the right motivation, right concentration, all of that, in the Vajrayana, there are teachings that says it is more important, it has collected more merit by yourself, not other, yourself sipping a tea. You collect more merit than inviting three million Buddha for lunch for three months. Uh, the figure, I'm, I'm not so sure, but something like that. <laughs> you understand? But all this, I'm not making it up, really. You can refer to tantric texts. I know there are people who are saying that I'm this traditionalist, conservative, fascist, whatever, whatever. I don't know whether I'm that, but I think it is important to always go to the source, the text, and then work on that. There is a nothing that is not a method in the Vajrayana. If you know how to do it, everything becomes the path. That is the uniqueness, the unique quality of the Vajrayana. Yeah, one more, just one last. I know there's so many, but one last. Do you want to, ex do you want to have this no pain, all gain. <laughs> or you, you, or you are so practically minded. You say, "Oh no, no you know, no pain, no gain." I don't know. 
Ah, secretly, I'm sure you long for no pain, all gain. But your habitual mind pushes you to, you know, thinking no pain, no gain. Vajrayana is the path of no pain, all gain. Uh, I'm just giving you s just, you know, sort of a summary of this. Of course, these are very, very detailed teachings in each of this. Please, don't just, you know, jump to a conclusion and make some sort of a, you know, decision. Study it, you know. Search and look for this and see whether it's make, making uh, sense and so on and so forth. Okay, now... The, the second portion of the question is, how can it be best practiced in the modern world? This is a little bit of challenging for me. And this always frustrates me a little bit. Things have gone wrong from the beginning, I feel. I'm not talking here only. I'm talking right from, I think, mainly in Tibet. You know, concepts such as guru, guru devotion, guru yoga, it should never have been publicly available. These are meant to be those who are looking for that particular thing. But it's too late. It's all there. It's in the Google, it's in the Wikipedia, it's in the Amazon, in the every bookshops that you can think of. It's all there. So it's really difficult. Uh, in Tibet, You can sort of say that because there's a few conditions. Actually, this is, I've, I've written this on my 19-page thing. You know, because everyone is sort of Buddhist, culturally Buddhist, and also remember before 19, I don't know, 40s or 50s, nobody was there. I mean, only Tibetans, not many people. I mean, outsiders, very, very few. Even as a tourist, very few. And um, somehow the b Dharma ended up becoming part of the culture in everything. In paintings, I don't know, in a part of their day to day. You know, it's, it's a good thing. You know, it has its good side, but also, as I said earlier, it gets the Dharma gets hijacked. Uh, but anyway, it sort of worked in Tibet, sort of, I would say. But then something more worse happened in Tibet, I feel, when the Lamas become a political leader. things really went down the hill. And we will talk about this a little bit uh, later. 
this has really damaged the Buddha Dharma a lot. But the most sad thing and the most frustrating thing that I feel is I mean, how many of you in this room wants to be a Tibetologist? Maybe very few. Those who want to finish, I don't know, some dissertations on Himalayas, maybe that's all. Many of you came for enlightenment, for Dharma, for the spiritual path. What went wrong is most of the Lamas, including myself, we taught to the Western audience as we are teaching the Tibetan nomads 200 years ago. And this, I think, is a big, big mistake. You know how the Tantra was taught in India before, you know, before Tibetans got it from India. They kept it very quiet. Because this is a very, you know, it's not chewable by people who like Cinderella teachings. It's not that easy to digest. So these teachings are taught very, you know, carefully. Stories after stories. I can, I mean, Let's say Guru Rinpoche, Paman Sambhava, when he came to Tibet, is clearly written in his life story that he never told his students in Tibet to the kings and the queens, he never told his guru's name for many, many years. He refused. They said, okay, the one, when once he, wa he was asked, who's your guru, he just stood up and left. I think like several times, only several times, when people pushed him and requested him, he sort of said, are, are you sure? You really want to hear this? And then finally, he uttered the name of Shri Simha. These stories have a lot of profound teaching here. So, I, I don't know how collectively we can mend this, but I believe individually we can still individually choose to really, uh, what do you call it, um, re reintroduce this or um, apply this method. But as I said, this is the unfortunate part. How Tibetans... It is really unfortunate. Thinking about it makes me, you know, like, feel so... You know, okay, our teachers, they always say, the teachers are like a doctor. Students are like a patient. They has to have an interreaction, no? And the student, the doctor must know what, what's wrong with the patient. What seems to have happened is all the Tibetan Lama doctors who comes to the West and their patients, they don't even check. They don't pay attention. You know, recently I was asked, I'm not going to name the names here, right? And I was asked what to, how should we, what should we tell our leaders, you know, head, religious, you know, but head lamas, young lamas, especially young lamas. What should, what should we tell them? You know, you know, many of them, they think that they are becoming more modern. But that's usually like they learn a little bit of English or they watch BBC or CNN, that's about it. And I was suggesting, 
I, I, I remember saying them, all lamas from the top, they should read Harry Potter. They should read Jane Austen. They should read, I don't know. This, they need to know what is meant. What you say, what you, when you use a certain word, what is meant by you and what is meant for them. All kinds of words, compassion, self, love, non-violence, hell, samaya, breakage, etc., etc. So many of these, you need to know. But this hasn't happened, and it's really unfortunate. But at the same time, as I said, individually, we still, you know, it's never too, never late. Individually, we can still carry on, do the right thing. And that is, okay, so to answer the question, how can Vajrayana best be practiced in the modern world? Study. Pr be analytical. Be skeptical. Analyze. Um, have all the right preparation. So crucial. Absolutely. I know. But, you know, I have a sympathy. I have a sympathy with... Um... um so far, what has happened, you know, the way, uh, you know, how the Buddha Dharma sort of slowly get rooted into the West, the way, way is flowing. You know, there's a, the, uh, what I'm saying is the lack of preparation. I have a sympathy for both sides. I feel, you know, like, uh, you, know, or, you know, students also get excited to when they see a mandala. Oh, there's a sand powder mandala. And the monks, uh, they dismantle it afterwards. All these are exciting to hear. And this tantra, and then that gets connected to some other business. And then, you know, it's so juicy, blah, you know. So there was a lot of rush decisions from both sides, student and the teacher. But I have to single out the teacher because they are supposed to know better. They should give a warning. They should really, you know, say no. And yes. So study. Be analytical. Be really thorough in your as much. And study what? Sharvakayana, Mahayana, Madhyamika, Uttara Tantra, Abhidharma, Prajana Paramita, all these texts. Because Every major tantric text, such as the He Vajra Tantra, mentions that. It says, in the He Vajra Tantra, Tantra, it says, a student must first learn, learn Vabhyashika school of Buddhism. Then he should be taught Sautrantika uh, 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 Buddhist uh, view, so on and so forth. So important. Okay, now, there are some of us, okay, we didn't really do proper preparation. We sort of jump into, what do you call it, this path. But it's sort of good, it's, you know. Yeah, I did a little bit of a, you know, rush decision, but it, it's okay for me. It's, it's like rewarding. Whatever, you know, you still want to follow the Tantra. Basically, you want to follow the Tantra, even though you may have no good preparation. You have already done the entering into the Tantric world. Then I would suggest one thing. Keep it quiet. Yes. And again here, the Tibetans haven't done a good job. Lamas themselves from the highest to the lowest, we didn't do a good job on that one. Why? 
Because, you know, in places like Tibet, you know, the thangkas of the, you know, deities, such, you know, some deities with the, I don't know, skull head and the pig head and uh, what, um, with a consort. So much there in the paintings and it's almost like an em emperor's clock, is it? You don't even see it. But the lamas should know this is a different setup. This is a different world. You are facing with a different kinds of audience. Audience who asks, who thinks, who are educated in different way. So, I think the lamas need, but anyway, from both the student and the teacher, they need to keep this quiet. Secret, okay, we are talking about secret now. That's a really, really dangerous word, isn't it? A secret. Because in the world where we have to cherish the transparency, transparency, the word secret is not a good word. I know this. But I want to explain this a little bit before I go to the next one. The word sangwa, secret, in the Vajrayana, again, as I said, remember I said, you know, be, we have to really, each word we need to really contemplate. Many times the tantric secret is very, very paradoxical and contradictory and very, very complicated. And you need to learn this. I will give you some example. Okay, one. If there are times in the Tantra you will hear things like, if you show a Tantric deity or a Tantric mandala to a cow, it's a good thing to do. Why? Because the cows, the cows they don't think. I guess not. I don't know. I, I'm afraid again I'll be misquoted as a what anti animal, whatever, whatever. So <laughs> I'm basically, you know, I think my nails are going to finish. Uh, you know, it's so scary. Everything gets misinterpreted here, there. But let's imagine what the cows don't think. You show a mandala. With the right motivation, may this cow get connected to the Vajrayana mandala. Fine. You are not reveal. you don't have the problem of revealing the secret. Okay? Now, if you reveal your tantric teachings or experience to a realized being, fantastic! That's the best offering you get, you have. You should. We encourage you. Now, you are not, if you reveal your technique, teachings, or experience of your Tantra to a half smart, I don't want to use derogatory words, I don't know, <laughs> half smart people, you understand? Uh, sort of intellectually, kind of okay, but half smart people. If you are fortunate, they will keep quiet. Most likely, they will li like to make a comment. And when they make a comment, this comment will stay in your head as a concept. And the concept is so difficult to delete. It's not like your app that you don't want, that you can just push it into the trash. So difficult. This is why the importance of secrecy. It's got nothing to do with the Tantra has some strange sort of flaw that Tantra needs to be kept secret. No, nothing. Tantra secrecy is really meant as an act of compassion to those who are not matured. Okay, that's one example. 
Another example I will give you about secrecy. Let's say I am your guru. Okay, tantric guru. I am your tantric guru. You have received the initiation. You have chosen me as a tantric master. And then I say to you, okay, from today onwards, you are supposed to keep Wednesday as a secret. That is your job. I know, everybody knows Wednesday. And you know, everybody knows there is a Wednesday. It's printed everywhere in the, in every calendar, it's there is a Wednesday. But that is your job. That is the part, that is the mind training. Remember, you love mind training, don't you? Mm, this is a mind training. You ask for it. That's one way of secret, that's one kind of a secrecy. Now, let me tell you an another kind of secrecy, which is actually the most profound level, is this. It's so much smeared by chocolate, you don't see the spotlessness of the <laughs> cup. So that's why it's the spotlessness, yeah? spotless, spotless aspect of the cup is concealed by chocolate. Now, you are facing with the people who absolutely, who absolutely want to believe that cup is inherently dirty. You have to be careful here now. You can't say, hey, hey, no, 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 cup is empty, you know. They will flip. You better say, yes, it is dirty. Let's buy a washing machine. Let me bring a, what do you call it, a washing, I don't know, powder, mop, what do you call it? Brush, whatever, whatever, you know. You should really dramatize. You should get along with them. And then, you know, like, as if they, you know, this is why the tantric guhya, the, the sound, the tantric word, the Sanskrit word guhya has to be understood. I know these are really, really complicated subjects, but I just want to express this because at least it will be, I hope this will become sort of a siege to, you know, Remember, how can it be, how can it best be practiced in the modern world? That's what we are talking here. And I've already said, study, keep it quiet, and what's next? And there's many, just few. Next, don't misbehave. Oh, gurus, students, They misbehave so much. There is a reason why this man, Guru Rinpoche Padma Sambhava said, your view has to be as vast as the sky and your action has to be as subtle as a flower. You are supposed to behave. Do you know what my gurus have told me? You have to Practice outwardly, you have to practice such as a Sharvakayana people. Ethically correct, soothing, inspiring, gentle, I don't know, serene, all that look. Chisotar, Nang Changsem. Inwardly, Okay, I'm talking about how not to misbehave, okay? Inwardly, you keep the bodhicitta of the Mahayana. So outside, you look like a Sharvakayana people. Inside, you are filled with the bodhicitta of the Mahayana. Secretly, only secretly. Okay, just give you an example. 
let's say, and this happened, I know, I, I'm, I know. His name is Lama Gelek, by the way. Just, he's a really good monk. I'm, I'm talking about Bhikshu, you know, the Vinaya monk. And uh, we used to tease him a lot, and we, we were so bad, you know, good monks, good nuns, we are always teasing them. And you know, because he's a he's practicing this, you know, vinaya. He's always, what do you call it? Um, he's always like a uh, finicky. What do you call it? Panicky. Panic. You know, like a little bit paranoid almost, like about you know sitting. In, in one room with one uh, uh, female and all this kind of, you know, the monk business, you know, he, he's always so careful, he's just so good monk. He practices, he practices because he was a monk. But I know what he does also every evening. And he has an attendant who is still alive, by the way, this attendant. And he will do a chok offering every evening. And then secretly, and I've seen, you know, later on I noticed this one. He, he never told us for a long time. He then give this chok feast. And his attendant is busy every evening offering it to ladies. As if it is coming from somewhere. It doesn't matter. It, and later I really, you know, sort of, pushed him to, why are you doing this? And he said, oh, you know, I'm a practitioner and I'm really trying to sort of, you know, go through the practice of the Sharvakayana, Bodhicitta and the Vajrayana. And, you know, I have no, I have no wrong view towards women, but I am practicing, I'm a monk. You know, this is what the Vinaya says. But sometimes my emotion of having desire also happens but more than that he says my this paranoia of needing to keep my monk's vow ends up sometimes acting very inappropriate he says and this is really not good because you know all the women are none other than the dakini and this is really not good for my samaya i think it's a really really good example i would say and there are so many people who who does like this. So, outwardly, Vinaya, or the Sharvakayana way, innerly, Mahayana, and secretly, Vajrayana. Should we take a break? Maybe we take a break. It's getting really hot. Okay. So the next 
going back to the our sort of the topic of being here in the face of current political and special trends how can misunderstandings of the vajrayana path be avoided short answer is i'm afraid i don't think we can avoid misunderstanding so much misunderstanding of the vajrayana is nothing new it existed long time before in places like you know it's very interesting you go to places like sri lanka they don't even accept mahayana as a teaching of the buddha you know like vajrajedika sutra whatever they don't but then the mahayana countries like japan or china they don't accept vajrayana as a teaching this existed long before this is nothing new and there are many reasons for this um because okay big part of the reason is because the vajrayana is so what do you call it um um out of the box i guess maybe the word is the out of the box that's just not acceptable and um many people just say it's made up by people um on the other hand this is interesting okay the sri lanka let's say sri lanka they don't accept mahayana as a teaching of the buddha mahayana people they don't accept the vajrayana as the teaching of the buddha okay on the other way around vajrayana must accept the mahayana without the mahayana ground of the sort of sort of foundation of the vajrayana is finished and they have to also accept the sharvakayana because without the sharvakayana ground of the whole buddha dharma is not there so the vajrayana people have the burden to accept this too and they on the other hand they 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 have never ex- never accepted this is this is always there um as i said partly because it's out of zone you know out of box a lot of things and also just just mind boggling stuff um you know talking like emotion as the path it won't go down very well in a monastery you understand it doesn't and um arguing like oh what's the didn't buddha teach emptiness you you know what's the difference between hair less or full hair isn't that both concept let's go beyond we want to go very well remember i was always talking about the cinderella category you know you can't push this of course the vajrayana can always go on explaining all sorts of things you know the you know this is the this is how the vajrayana would argue okay let's say you are facing with a sharvakayana person and then you ask the sharvakayana is buddha omniscient and omnipotent does buddha have many other disciples which the sharvakayana have to say yes they have to many of the their sutra also ends with oh gods and the uh, gantarvas and the nagas they all applaud and they all rejoice and so on and so forth they are 
that kind of, you know, mention, even in the Sharvakayana Sutra. So then the Vajrayana people say, well, you know, what happened in Varanasi, in Saranath, when outwardly when Buddha was teaching a general audience, samsara is full of suffering, the suffering must be understood, cause of the suffering must be abandoned, the cause of the suffering is emotion, so on and so forth. There are other people who are hearing this, those who have the inclination or the faculty of the what we call Tantra, they heard it totally different. They heard samsara is blissful. Emotion, the cause of the suffering is uh, wisdom. That's what they heard. Now you can't really dispute this too much because even in this audience, even my 19 pages got interpreted in 10 directions, even me. And I'm sure today, as I'm talking, by tomorrow there will be a lot of interpretations. And those who are stuck with being positive, they will be stuck as being positive. <laughs> you understand, those who are, you know, stuck with being negative, they will be, you know, they will, they will interpret negatively. That's how it is. Another argument that the Vajrayana always present is, does the Vajrayana accept things like four seal, four noble truth? Does Vajrayana accept that all the compounded things are impermanent? Of course. That emotion, you know, all emotions are pain. All that, whatever is taught in the Sharvakayana and the Mahayana, Vajrayana accepts. And this is why you cannot also outwardly sort of get rid of the Vajrayana. So this, by the way, this debate will go on long time. So in the face of current political and social trend, how can misunderstanding of the Vajrayana path be avoided? I mean, to completely avoid the misunderstanding, I think it's going to be difficult. But as I said earlier, I think the safeguard will happen if we study, be critical, be analytical, and um, remember, if you are a little bit convinced, then keep it quiet. Lay low, low profile, no need to exhibit, no need to... Really, you know, this morning I was thinking, you know, like... Tibetan Guru comes. Trumpet is blown. The scarf. And even his shoes gets taken off by ten people. <laughs> I don't know, stuff like this. Obviously people will think that this is a cult. Do you think the Naropa and Telopa's shoes gets taken off by this bunch of group of people? No. All these teachings happen in a cemetery, somewhere, you know, some in the bar, some in the prostitute house, some in the forest, some on the top of the mountain. Nobody knew what was happening. So this is why I keep on blaming us, our you know, Tibetan way of doing things. You know, I, I, I've told this recently to people. You know, a few years ago, I was in Varanasi, just roaming around. And I like uh, the Shiva Tantra. You know, the Shiva Tantra is very profound. And then somehow I, I bump into this Shiva practitioner. It's really good. So I was so attracted to him, you know, he's so, just, just so majestic. And anyway, finally I asked him, you know, I want to learn about Shiva Tantra. Would you give me the teachings? He said, yes. Very short word, yes. You know, my normally, okay, I thought, okay, so when should I come tomorrow? You know, like, oh, today, when? You know, like that. He said, oh, he said, first, for three years, you have to come, you have to stay in my house, and you will not receive any teaching, you just have to do my household work. <laughs> I have to say, I was sad, full of sadness, full of joy, I don't know, wow. 
such things exist even today. Even today, in today's day and age. To me, he exhibited he's a really good tantric practitioner. Because he could make fortunes from me, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, I will teach you. Come this afternoon, 4 o'clock, the course is going to, uh, you know, cost you uh, every hour $10 or something. It's not, nothing like that. I'm supposed to serve, you know. It made, it threw me off. That's how it used to be. So that one didn't happen. And I, I keep on coming back to this. So then this relate to this, you know, like question. You could be, we have this question. Is Vajrayana feudal and outdated? I want to just discuss this on a little bit. Um, recently I was reading, you know, because this is an, I thought, you know, finally people are going to pay some attention. Finally people are a little bit, you know, like bothering about this. So I, you know, I read it here, there, and um, I found two, one is from Stephen Batchelor, who wrote, in Tibet, the doctrines and the practice of the Vajrayana were merged with the feudal structure of power. The problem is system systemic. It lies in the synergy of tantric doctrines and feudal structure that allow a teacher to legitimate abuse civic behavior to himself and his students. And then in similar, Another, I think quite, you know, respected scholar, Ian Baker, he said, Vajrayana in the 21st century inherently aligns itself adherence, uh, adherence with socio-cultural ideologies of pre-medieval India and feudal politics of China, Mongolia and Tibet. lot of it I have to agree, as I have been explaining. They are right, a lot of this. But they should also, I'm sure they know, maybe they don't know, but they should know, there were people like Paltu Rinpoche, there were people like Milarepa, there were a lot actually, if you count, you know, Quantity why what do you call it? Uh, statistic. Statistically speaking, I would say eighty percent of the people were not into this feudal whatever, whatever. They themselves actually suffered a lot. Most of so called the great masters that we always try to emulate, they didn't have ranks. Yeah, I know it's so, just so frustrating how the Tibetans are so in love with the words like His Holiness, His Eminence. This is something new. Ranks given by Chinese, Mongolia, all of this. But many great masters, they didn't have that majority of them, and this you need to know. Because I don't want to also paint this, I don't want people to, this is what I mean by misunderstanding of the Vajrayana. People may think that, oh, Vajrayana, er, all, er, everything about Vajrayana is about a feudal, because, you know, prominent voice and spokesperson like them, their statement means a lot for a lot of people. People read them, people respect them. So. And um, especially if they claim themselves as a Buddhist, it's very important to protect the Buddha Dharma. Yes, of course, you have to scrutinize, you have to criticize, you have to really dig the fault of those who have fault. But, you know, you have to also know the consequences of such statement. And this is not only the case in the past. Many of you know Allah Zenkar Rinpoche? Does he have any rank? No. He's probably one of the 
one person that I trust the most. So knowledgeable. He looks like this old Chinese dumpling seller. <laughs> we don't even know where he is. So learned, so respected. If you were to ask me, is there anyone who, who I am in awe of? Not many, but he is one of them. When I see him, I get nervous. Because this man is authentic. Authentic people, genuine people, shatters me. Because, you know, suddenly, oh, I, I better behave. You know, like, <laughs> because these guys are special. They have no rank. So it's not always like this. And I myself, under my, what do you call it, caretaking, right this very moment, even as we speak, there's about 500 monks and nuns doing lifelong retreat. So it's not just sort of, you know, like cultural, feudal, like that. It's kind of important that you know. But anyway, um, in the next, I think we will quickly try to do this and then these few questions. What safeguards can be put in place to protect the sacredness of the guru-student relationship? It's so unfortunate that you know, this is what I mean. No enough information, no, and not, no complete information. Past few months, I've been hearing about guru devotion a lot. But I never hear devotion to the student. You know what I mean? They, it's equally there. But it has, the guru devotion has become the issue. Student devotion, you know, guru, guru's devotion to the student. It's so important, very important. Student is good, more important than the guru's own child. Child, your son, your daughter, most likely is for this life. Student, until enlightenment, it's a long time project. <laughs> it's a really, really important. This needs to be addressed too. Um, okay, but to begin with, the word guru Indian word, Sanskrit word, which, which, by the way, in India, the guru refers to a lot of things, you know, it refers to even sometimes taxi drivers, uh, or it, it basically whoever is giving you some sort of instruction. But I think here, now, the guru is almost exclusive word that is used by the Vajrayana people. I, th I don't know, for some reason, that's what, what happened. So I think when, whenever we are talking about the guru, I think we are assuming that we are talking about the Vajrayana-related guru. And in the Mahayana, I guess we use the words like a Mahayana master, even though the Sanskrit word guru is teacher. Mm. Yes, concept Vajrayana's guru concept is not in the Shadvakayana. Please make note of that. Vajrayana, Vajrayana's concept of guru is not in the Shadvakayana. Not only in the not only is not in the Shadvakayana, it's not in the Mahayana also. Therefore, both the Shadvakayana and the Mahayana also don't talk about the pure perception and so on and so forth. It's, it's not in there. So, guru and the pure perception is very 
exclusive vajrayana thing and you need to know this uh, and i'm emphasizing this because as i said earlier you don't have to be you don't have to practice the vajrayana there is whole beautiful sharvakayana and mahayana path that you can choose where you don't have to go through, where you don't have to go with these criteria of samaya guru devotion pure perception and so on and so forth but again i'm sorry maybe you are getting bored with this again i have to come back to the the tibetan mishandling of the guru bus guru business guru as it is known in the vajrayana is so personal and so individual but you know what happened in places like tibet many guru become a head of an institute i mean theoretically it's possible theoretically possible but there is a lot of precarious situation here you know this this is something that i think the tibetan lamas really have to know to be a head to be a guru of a somebody and to be a head of a non profit organization transparency good governance you understand the public funding public whatever whatever there's a different category personal guru this is this is important that you know and i was just saying yesterday for instance like many people think like all tibetans root guru is his own as the lama it is not they each have their own you know tibetans even they say it by this uh, as a as a saying they said this sato sato to semba jayo no semto to sanje chigo something like this you know he, they said that even though there is 100 buddhas on earth in my mind there's only one guru so you know this is the sort of tibetan you know sort of saying and um this uh this this actually happens even now i i remember very well when i was receiving teaching from his son in the 16th karmapa rangjung rigbi dorje in nepal there used to be this practitioner a yogi who stays in a uh, mountain cave and he will come to receive teachings from um this old lama we call him devu rimbuche I, I still uh, yeah very old very very good lama this lama would come only to receive him receive teachings from him and uh, meanwhile all these grand teachings from the six in karma pa is going on he will not receive he will receive from this devu rimbuche who is really not highly ranked lama any of that he will just receive one or two instructions and he leaves i giving you as an example so guru to to take the tantric guru tantric guru is a very very individual and a personal thing head of the state head of the monastery head of a institute head of a non profit organization ah that's a different but many times when these two gets mingled up things gets very complicated and this need to sort it out somehow we need to at least talk about this i think this is one very important uh, very important uh, thing to discuss i think it's, yeah but you know and then what is guru fundamentally 
I mean, there's arguments like this. Didn't Buddha said you want you to rely upon on teachings, not a te not a person? Didn't he say that you are your own boss? Nobody is your boss. Yes, 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 all of that. And Vajrayana's teachings of the Guru does not contradict that at all. You need to know this one too. Because in the Vajrayana, Guru is not some sort of a... Um, in, the, in the Vajrayana, Guru is not, a, not only a person to whom you surrender. Guru, Guru is the Buddha, Guru is the Dharma, Guru is the Sangha, Guru is everything. Guru is the path. And this is, this is the unique teachings of the Vajrayana. Okay, when we talk about a Guru, and this is important, and again, this is mishandled, especially in the East, even in the Mahayana, I have noticed this, also definitely within the Tibetan. When we talk about a Guru, we usually talk about outer, inner, and the secret Guru. Inner and the secret Guru is none other than your own mind. I just want to put it very simply. That is something that you have. Outer Guru is a means. It's not the end. It's like a finger. It's not the moon. Moon is inner Guru and the secret Guru. But with the help of the outer Guru, you understand the inner and the secret Guru. This is why outer Guru also becomes important. But even outer Guru, again and again, the teachings have told us you have to analyze so much. It is unfortunate that people end up thinking you walk into a Dharma center, you receive a teaching, and then you end it up without any analysis, he or she has become your guru. It's not right. This is not the way. You have to analyze the guru. And once you analyze the guru, you still have a chance. You can just receive the, uh, by the way, you can just receive a refuge vow. He's not your tantric guru. You can even receive the bodhicitta vow. He's still not tantric guru. You can receive so, or you may, I don't know, maybe here I have to be a little careful. You can even maybe receive some general tantra introduction teachings, some general introductions. Mm, maybe still not your root guru or a tantric guru. But if you, after analysis, after, after a thorough contemplation, and then you want to elevate yourself to a, a, a practitioner that really wants to choose this path. Because it's an adventure. It's a really imp very dangerous um, uh, adventure. I think it was uh, Matthew Ricard, he, he, I think he gave the example of what mountain, mountain climber and the coach. You know, you can climb some small hill and you can have a coach not to worry so much. But if you are climbing some really, really dangerous, you have to trust this coach and the trust and the coach also has to trust you because you can both fall and die. <coughs> and you have the total right to choose and you need to know this. You have a total right to choose this. And if you choose it, it's your choice. And once you choose him or her as your tantric guru, and receive tantric teachings. And when I say tantric teachings, I'm talking about not just an introduction, you know, sort of, you know, like total, actually proper guidance. And, 
and especially all the abhishekas, such as the pointing out the nature of the mind, so on and so forth. That's it. He or she has become your most important person. And also, you have become most important person for him too. This is, this is, um, mm, what do you call it? This is important to know. And going back to the outer, in, uh, outer inner and secret guru, this, uh, I, I need to uh, tell you this a little bit. In the practice of the guru devotion, there's a something called guru yoga, as some of you may know. Show me one guru yoga where guru does not dissolve into you. What does that mean? It actually means guru is not external. But this, you know, I'm not saying that the Tibetan lamas have abused this. Oh yes, they do. They still do and they have done it before. What they have done is they they may, you know, I don't know, political influence, um, all kinds of influence. You know, they, they abuse this system and what do, you, what do you call it, violate the Vajrayana system. And that's really, the Lama himself, he will suffer with these consequences. Absolutely not acceptable. But there's always a human habit for instance, okay, coming from Asia, you know, in Asia, you know, the leaders, um, you know, I spoke this recently with some Chinese students. We were talking about the Guru Yoga. And then many times when we talk about the Guru Yoga, you know, in, a, in Asia, you know, patriarchal father, the leader, the dear leader, and then you follow... And then somehow the Asian somehow gets mixed up with this. The guru devotion is basically something like this, you know, like really dangerous. If you go to North Korea and say, okay, towards the end, Kim Jong-un dissolved into me. <laughs> and I have become inseparable with Kim Jong-un, you'll go to prison. He won't like this. But the whole point of the Guru Yoga is to, to reach the Panden Lami Gopang Thoparsho. This is what we say always. To reach the state of the Guru. guru. So, really, the Guru, you know, um, Stephen Batchelor's article is uh, about. I quit the Guru Yoga. I hope he didn't quit the Guru Yoga because Guru Yoga is really, really profound. It's really, really, it's such an amazing, what do you call it, method of to understand the non-duality. I will give you one example. Sometimes you have to visualize the Guru with a pig head. How is that? How is that for the, you know, visualizing your beloved Guru with a pig head? Ah, oh, well, Vajrayana does. It's a really a pith practice and the path to actualize the non-duality. I think this is a, such a big subject, I don't think I can cover it all, but um, hopefully I can sort of add as, you know, I'm traveling different paths. Um, Maybe questions? I think, I don't know. I, I made, uh, I'm looking at some of these questions, but now I'm getting a little disoriented, so maybe the questions. How does someone become a guru? Is there a difference between becoming a guru and a Vajrayana master?
Well, I think as I, I think I've already sort of said this. Um, Vajrayana master is when you give the tantric initiation. How does one become teacher? General teacher when you imp uh, when you you know dedicate when you teach um, a teaching when you give a trans you know, yeah, teach when you show when you coach somebody spiritually I guess you end up having this um, label as a guru but you know. I know there's just so many who wants to become guru. <laughs> if only they know. I'm not only talking about its its challenges, you know, you know, the obvious challenge. But wow. If you don't have the right view, if you don't have the right motivation, you have the this job that really is like the, I don't know, key to making everybody suffer. Burn the seed of devotion. It's the worst kind of job. So, what was the question? How to become the guru? How to become? How does someone become a guru? I see, yeah. I think, I think that's good. Okay, next question. What do you think of Sogyal Rinpoche personally? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. First, I'm not a Mahasiddha. I have to tell you this. And this is not just an exhibition of usual Tibetan phony humility. This actually is a bit of a disclaimer. <laughs> really. I'm not a Mahasiddha. So, what I'm saying is how I see, doesn't matter so much, even Donald Trump, all my projection is a projection of a sentient being who is defiled, narrow-minded, lopsided, uh, what do you call it, prejudice, all of this. You understand? So, whatever I say, um, please don't take it as a command of a Buddha. My word is just my own projection, and this I want to tell you first. Um, you know, I'm one of those kind of a very fortunate person, I think, in one way, who had the opportunity to see some of these amazing masters. When I was growing up, there was a lot of them. Oh my, so many. Every direction there's one great master. Okay? Now, for some reason, I have, I, I have been introduced and recognized and sort of enthroned as the incarnation of Chen Chokri Lord. Uh, I sometimes think that this is the first ever karmic mistake. Um, but anyway, and by the way, I, I want, I'm not saying that I don't believe in reincarnation. I just don't, I just can't believe that I'm a reincarnation of this great being. And I've actually, and this is something so beautiful, this is beside the point here, but I want to tell you this. I expressed this to Chabji Tengu Chen Rinpoche. I clearly remember this in Paru Chichu. I said, Rinpoche, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe at all I'm a reincarnation of Chen Tzu you know what he said? Good. You keep on thinking this. This is good for you. This is how, you know, 
even though I have been sort of being very critical towards the Tibetan system, system, there are parts of the Tibetan upbringing, the spiritual training, they are so beautiful, so amazing, so sophisticated. And I still remember this, you know, yeah, keep on thinking that. And then years later, I don't know, as if he remembered what he said, he called me, this is in Nepal, and he said, if you ever doubt that you are not what you call it, you are not who you are supposed to be, then he said, you should pray to Jangan Chensi Wangpo and Chensi Chokil Lord, and pray to them to fulfill their aspiration. What a nice thing to hear. You understand? Anyway, I'm supposed to be incarnation of Chensi Chokil Lord, and Sogir Rinpoche happened to be student of Chensi Chokil Lord. There are so many other Chensi Chokil Lord students at that time, um, so that is the connection, but I have not spent time with Sogya Rinpoche because I didn't need to, as I said earlier, there were many other teachers and there were many other, what do you call it, uh, students of Chensi Chogu Lodre, who I can refer to, and um, I think I remember Sogirimbaji going to some um, school in Kalimpong, I think so, right? Kalimpong or Darjeeling. And uh, he would come during the winter holiday because he comes to see Kanto Siring children who happen to be his um, auntie. Auntie, right? Yeah. But, uh, you know, I was busy, really, so vigorous training, you know, traditional training, really, really vigorous. So that's about it. And then much years later, yes, um, Sogar Rinpoche also invited me to some of his centers, which you know, many of you know. I have uh, come to some of the uh, several centers. Mm, I have not received any teachings from Sogar Rinpoche, and I never had the wish to receive so teachings from Sogar Rinpoche. I, so therefore, I don't have any kind of, you know, pure perception or wow, you know, what a great teacher. I will, you know, I will say I didn't have any of that. Um, I was always very amazed about Rigpa and Rigpa phenomena. And as the year goes by, I felt Rigpa is a very important entity. It is a very important sort of vessel for the propagation of the Buddha Dharma in general and especially Vajrayana. And this is really a doing of Sogar Rinpoche. For that, you know, I rejoice. And then another thing about Sogar Rinpoche, unlike many Rinpoches who are always so, you know, protective of their turf, turf, Sogar Rinpoche seems to bring all sorts of teachers to you, which is, hmm, which is, you know, something kind of not, other lamas don't do this. Yes, yeah, some people may argue saying, oh, that's just, to build his own authenticity, what, what do you call it? Like to build his, what do you call it, uh, credential, whatever. Okay, yeah, why not? You know, both sides, argument. You know, I can understand, people can feel, but you know, uh, many of people here and many other parts of the world, uh, you had uh, um, encountered great masters such as Jabji Dujam Rinpoche, Tengu Chensi Rinpoche, Trishik Rinpoche. I mean, they're all here. His all in his Dalai Lama due to, you know, Sogar Rinpoche's, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, vision and his uh, activity. So that I thought was good. Then another thing. This is all my projection, okay? Another thing that I like about Sogar Rinpoche is he doesn't, he never really made up sort of quasi-Buddhism, whatever, you understand, which, which happens a lot these days. 
you know, people steal uh, Buddhist ideas from here, Buddhist ideas from there, and they package well, and they never mention about the Buddha. Of course, they never mention about the, their guru. They almost make people believe that this is their original idea, package it well and sell it. Mm. I don't know, maybe I'm blind. I didn't see that aspect so much. In fact, it's the other way around. He's very traditional. He's very, you know, into these things. You understand? So that one, you know, I can see. You can, you can see from both sides. Now, one thing, And this, I have expressed this to Sogar himself, not much, one or two times, because every time I mention this, he gets a little bit, I don't know, unhappy is not the right word, maybe, a little bit uncomfortable. Um, you know, people like me, I live in the East. I have things going on in the East, in India, in China, you know, I have things going on there. So of course I have to deal with the Tibetans in a Tibetan way. But someone like him, he has decided to have the things going on here. So I thought, well, he should really try to understand the West and the Western way. I don't know, from my very limited point of view, I feel that he's imposing so much the Tibetan stuff. But then, you know, many students also like these things. Even, you know, I myself have some students in California who really, you know, I always, you know, like emphasize chanting in English. And there are, you know, some old Dharma students, Westerner, they oppose. Totally, oh, it doesn't sound good. In the Tibetan, it sounds nicer, blah, 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 all of this. You understand? So, I, you know, from both sides. But I will have to say, this, this is always something that I have been, uh, what do you call it? Um, I've always thought he could do better here. I clearly remember when he was first starting Let Up Ling, I said, oh, immediately my... That actually advice was not even asked for, but I voluntarily said, you know, you know, this center, you should really make it so European. No Tibetan traces, because Europeans, you know, people need to feel comfortable. All this Tibetan paraphernalia, yes, the Tibetologists, these people, this generation, 1960s, baby boomer generations, they will feel a little bit of a sympathy because in their mind, Tibetans are endangered species, whatever. <laughs> but this is not going to last long. The children, they need something else. So you need to really prepare for that. I have said this. But somehow, I, I'll be very honest here, here, he wasn't, and, and this, he wasn't really open for this. And this have always puzzled me. And then, and this is again purely my projection, and this is what I have written also in, the, in my 19 pages. And this is very, very, very subjective, by the way. From how I see, it looks like Sogya Rinpoche is not, he's not doing this preparation thing that I was talking earlier, before you receive the tantric teachings. That bit, especially towards, towards, the, towards the recently, I felt he wasn't doing this enough, and this is not good. But that's my personal proje uh, projection. I mean, the, I have met students who didn't even know that the three words of Garab Doji is the Vajrayana. But on the other hand, someone, many people also said that this same student has been there in the teachings for 20 years. 
and they have heard that Vajrayana teach, this is a Vajrayana. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, be, you know, I, but my gross generalization, gross projection of Soviet Rinpoche is the preparation part maybe is lacking and this is not good. And, you know, he's, as I said, I think I've already said this, he, he stationed here, he went to the school here, he should know the Western mind, Western thinking, and Western, I don't know, whatever, the rules, the attitudes, the phenomena. So this has always been a little bit of a puzzle, puzzlement for me. In light of what's happened, how can we serve Sogyal Rinpoche today? I think those who are totally devoted to Rinpoche, no matter what, fantastic. You have chosen this path. You have done it soberly. You have deliberately done this. Now you should, yes, it's really good that you are even asking question how to serve your teacher. Now you should serve by promoting study, analysis, and the critical thinking of the Vajrayana Buddhism and the Dharma. That, you know, because Dharma is the more, Dharma is at the end is much more important. So, study and the practice is the way to serve the serve Rinpoche. What are the signs and features whereby an unknowing Western person like me can tell that the essence of the Vajrayana is given genuinely and completely? And what indicates that I understood the doctrine properly? Mm. Since the Vajrayana seems to be perfectly self-contained, it is, is it even possible to translate such perfection into the West or any other culture? I think it is slowly is possible to translate, but anyway, here I think it's a similar connected to my the earlier answer. Here again, you need the preparation. You need to study. You need to really anal analyze. Only through that, then you can also be prepared for the Vajrayana. What does it mean nowadays, and what did it mean in ancient times in the Buddhist world? to offer one's body, speech, and mind to the three jewels or to a master? Mm. This is a very big question. And to answer this very briefly will not do the justice. But anyway, I will just throw something here. Um, I don't know. So, you know. This is the thing. This is what I said. You know, these things should not be even discussed in the public. But it's too late. So now we, are, we have to, you know, because there's an issue here. So we have to discuss, isn't it? In the Vajrayana, there are many different kinds of practices. One practice is called mandala offering, for instance. And this is one angle, huh? one angle. And by the way, the mandala offering, even though it may not be called mandala offering, it exists even on the Sharvakayana and the Mahayana level. People in the Sharvakayana and the Mahayana, you know, in the Sharvakayana, have you been to Burma? They offer arms to the monks. In the Mahayana, also there is an offering of flowers and incense, and then if you can, you can even give up your body to the hungry tigers, so on and so forth, remember? Now in the Vajrayana, the most supreme method, the most supreme offering is your inhibition. You are supposed to offer your inhibition. This is just one example. And your inhibition usually is nestled, nestled, like 
hidden in the three shells. And those three shells are called body, speech, and mind. So you crack these three shells and then you let go all these do's and don'ts. And so that's what it is talking about. It's, it's a really, it's a, it's, a, it's a deep subject, but needs much more explanation. And please, uh, for, based on what I've just told you, don't immediately jump and you know, make a commentary. Instead, please, further study, whether you want to criticize or whether you want to praise, further study. Okay. What the Dalai Lama and Minju Rinpoche are saying, and what you, Olgan Topkyo Rinpoche, and Kempo Namdral are saying, are two different things. Can you please clarify? <laughs> Very good. Um, Ojin Rinpoche is there also? Yeah? Okay. How do I begin this? <laughs> First, I want to say this. I think there's a lot of lost, what? Lost, of, lost in translation, misinterpretation, editing. Remember I said editing, sound effect? I feel there's a lot. From my side, I have never said that the moment you walk into a Tibetan Vajrayana temple, you bump into a guru, and then you end up receiving whatever teachings, then you do not analyze, you do not over criticize. I never said this. Never. You have to analyze. Remember, this is the subject that I've been repeating so much today. You have to analyze, you have to really prepare. Jing Mei Lingpa said this also. You know, the tantric, the classic tantric talks about analyzing the guru and the student 12 years. You don't have 12 years because you don't even have a time for 19 page. <laughs> but at the least, you should analyze. Really. From both sides, not only from one side. But once you consciously decide to take somebody as your tantric master, and please, Again, I repeat, tantric master, from whom you receive a complete initiation. Then, this is the path you have chosen. It's like this. You want to be an ordinary soldier? Then be an ordinary soldier. You want to be what? Navy seal? Navy seal? Well, then that's your choice. You want to be, you know, special, then you choose this path. But you have to decide this first. I mean, there are, there is one mention I have to clarify. If you choose this tantric master, thorough examination, everything, but you end it up bumping, you realize that this man is not a good man. He's a lunatic. He's crazy, he's harming everyone. Then what do you do? Try your best to have the pure perception, but if it is not working, quietly distance yourself. There is a mentioning, mentioning like that in the Karma Changme, uh, from the Karma Changme teachings and stuff like that. Quietly. You don't want to make big mess. And then do the chok offerings and so on and so forth. But other than that, you cannot. This is the path you have chosen. Now, I think uh, the question is about what His Holiness Dalai Lama said. And Minjur Mbache. Minjur Mbache. Uh, okay. The Minjur Mbache is one, I, I don't know. Um, I'm a I'm little bit puzzled with this one because His Holiness Dalai Lama, not once, not twice, many times, he has said, and it's even written and is made into books. I don't know whether you have read it. He, when he gave teachings, he said, general teachings, you know, talk, 
philosophy talks is okay. Everybody can listen. But anyone who is about to receive a vow, he said this vow, and especially Vajrayana initiation from him. And if they are practicing this protector, do you remember? Any one of you remember this? Some, there was a little bit of an issue a few years ago. Anyone who practices this protector, he requested them to leave. Why does he have to say, do that? If you keep on receiving the initiation, keep on scrutinizing the Guru, keep on criticizing the Guru, keep on having the pure, impure perception whenever you want, or whenever you can, or whenever you need it, then no need to go through this analysis. Not only that, if you can still have that kind of analysis and what impure perception, then why do the tantric texts have to emphasize on analyzing the Guru in the beginning? You understand what I mean? Why do you have to analyze first? I mean, they are talking about 12 years of analysis. Skip that, because you can still analyze later. You know what I mean? And then I will tell you something which is sort of puzzling for me. As I said, Guru devotion, pure perception is a practice that you have to choose. You choose consciously. You are supposed to choose this. I know many people may have not. But that's how the tantric, this is why, why I wanted to explain. The tantric, according to the tantric rule, this is the path. You choose and then you practice that pure perception. No matter what happens, you try to see this is your projection. This and everything is pure, so on and so forth. There's a lot of, you know, instructions. Okay. Let's say you are not a Vajrayana practitioner. Let's say you are a Mahayana practitioner. Okay. Let's say Vajrayana is too strange, cultish, you know, feudalist. Let's forget Vajrayana. Let's practice Mahayana. Okay, so you have, you have become a Mahayana practitioner. What is the essence of the Mahayana practice? Compassion, isn't it? And you are supposed to have a compassion to all sentient beings unconditionally. You can't say, oh, I will have a compassion towards um, some Africans in Rwanda, but not Donald Trump. You can't. That is the path you have chosen. And you can't also choose, I will have a compassion towards this man when, as long as he behaves. <laughs> you are supposed to have compassion no matter what he does. Is he a good boy? Have compassion. Bad boy? Compassion. Tail growing suddenly? Compassion. Horn going, growing? Compassion. You have, this is the path you have chosen. It is the, it is, that's how it is. And you know, I'm sorry, you know, I can't, you know, you, know, you can't change that. People seem to think that some lamas can change this because now the time is modern, you know. You can't because, you know what? If you ask a lama to change that rule, you are making him into a cult leader. Can you see the logic? Because a cult leader does this. They don't go by the book. They do whatever they want. Okay, what do people want to hear? Ah, that's what people want to hear. Then, you know, they make up. You can't do that. You know, as I said right in the beginning, I'm not an enlightened being. I'm, you know, I'm a sentient being. I have desire. I have anger. I have ambition. I, you know, I have what do you call it? Agendas. I'm very, you know, like um, ambitious. And in this day and age. If I follow my ambition, I should be saying, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever 
general people want to hear. I make it up. Mindfulness, breathe out, breathe in, you know. And then, then in, after a week later, you read a, maybe a magazine and see which, what is the current trend, current fashion, and then change the meditation method a little bit. I can make millions. I, but if you want to really follow up, you know, uh, you know, by the book, it's not possible. So, what I'm saying is, there must be a misinformation or mistranslation. As for this person called Ojin Tabja Rinpoche, who I know very well, <laughs> and I had actually just recently, I had a really, you know, no, why did you say these things? You know, he, he, what he talked about, and he, and so interesting, talking to him. First of all, as I said earlier, no Tibetan, very few Tibetan lamas even know about the Western world. Not only they know about the Western world, I don't think they don't even want to know. <laughs> they don't. This is what I wrote in my 19 page thing. The only guy I feel that who someone, someone who really paid a little bit of attention is Chogyam Trungpa. I thought. You know, Oji Rinpoche admits, he said, I'm not interested. <laughs> and he doesn't pretend that he, he knows. He says, I don't, I'm not interested. You know, there is a very confl conflicting thing that is going on in the Tibetan mind. One, they're, they're not interested. The another is a little bit of an inferior, inferiority complex. They always think, they always think, oh, Westerners are very smart. Westerners are smart. And this is the exactly, I, I get the response from him. You know, I was talking about the analysis and guru analysis and maybe that may have not happened, blah, blah, blah. And Ojin Dabji Rinpoche said, really? Westerners, even when they eat one food, they analyze how much gluten, <laughs> how, how much sugar. How come they didn't analyze Soge Rinpoche? <laughs> and then moreover, he said when he went to Rigpa centers or whatever, they were singing the songs of the life, of the long life, and everybody seems to be... So he thought, he actually said, wow, people are so devoted. As I said earlier, the Tibetans, people, Tibetan lamas, when they teach, Westerners, they think, the Westerners just think like the Tibetans. This is the fundamental fundamental, uh, what do you call it? Um, I guess, differences here. What's the meaning and purpose of obedience, devotion, and not criticizing the Vajrayana master after the initiation? What is the... What is the purpose? Oh. Hmm. Oh, this is a really big one. Unfortunately, not much time, but let's try. How should I, how can I put this in the sort of easier and compact way? A realization of the non-duality is one single aim from the Sharvakayana to the Vajrayana. Okay? How do the Sharvakayana do this? Through practicing like a revulsion towards the samsara, disciplining themselves with, you know, not eating dinner, I don't know, so many ways. That's how they slowly, slowly try to actualize the non-duality.
in the Mahayana, there's also many, many methods to understand the non-duality. But mainly through the compassion, the bodhicitta. Then, in the Vajrayana, on top of that, I have to emphasize this, on top of the Sharvakayana practice and the Mahayana practices, trying to have a pure perception to not only the Guru, by the way, to everything. The world, people, neighbor, everything. Not just the Guru. This is again partial, what you call it, information. But, because chances of you exercising the pure perception towards someone like Donald Trump at this point is less, then you choose someone you admire and respect. And that happened to be the Guru. And as I said earlier, I, I think I've already said this, also when you, you, when you pray to the Guru or when you practice the Guru Yoga, Guru is beyond men, women. Guru is often many times visualized as another form. And most importantly, you and the Guru become inseparable. That is the quintessence of the Guru Yoga. So in order to actualize the non-duality, Guru Yoga becomes very important. That, that was the question, isn't it? I what is the meaning and purpose of obedience, devotion, and not criticizing the Vajrayana yes. Master? Okay. So, deliver, once you choose the Guru, you try to mind, train your mind, this mind that always keep on seeing faults, that keeps on wanting to rebel. You try to train that mind through obedience, through not criticizing, through trying to see as wisdom, as the display of the wisdom, this is your personal, individual, custom-made practice that you have supposedly chosen. What does it mean when lamas like Kenshin Namjil talk about going to hell? You talked about Vajra hell in your article. Ah. I don't know whether you will understand this, but I will tell you a little bit. Remember earlier I was talking about the uniqueness of the Vajrayana? Remember? What did I say about confidence? I said, uh, what else did I say? Hmm? Non-violence, yeah? yeah? You know, Vajrayana always has a unique way of understanding. Okay, I will give you the Vajrayana hell. Are you ready? Again, this, you know, ideally we should not be speaking these things in the public, but what to do now, it's, you know, we are in this kind of situation. And this is, this, this, my, this will need a little bit of twisting of your mind, I, I guess. So prepare for this. Vajrayana hell. Don't imagine it's like burning iron, cauldron with what? Lavas, hell's, what, uh, hell's guardian <laughs> with a saw, chain. Ah, those are kindergarten hell. <laughs> you know what is the Vajrayana hell? How should I put this? It is the realm of rationalism and sensibility and 
reasoning. That is the Vajrayana hell. So, I will tell you, some practitioners, some really good practitioners, if you, they were given a choice, okay, here is a hot hell, you know, the burning, whatever. Here is this hot hell. Now, you have two choices. Do you want to go for, into this hot hell for a thousand years? Or you choose to be in this, uh, what is it, um, uh, realm of rationalism? By the way, it doesn't mean that you have to become irrational. Oh, yeah, that one, we, we, I'm assuming that we have long crushed. Irrationalism is not good. Remember, I've been telling the whole morning, you know, you have to be critical and all of that. But some practitioners, if, they are, if you are given a choice, either hot, this hot burning hell or realm of logic, causality, rationalism, many well do what good practitioners will they will not even think twice they will choose this one the hot hell because in their mind reasoning logic is one of the most vicious dungeon it's the wow it will bind you this thing called senses it makes sense oh this makes sense oh this is you know logical you know, that is the biggest bondage. This is a Vajrayana hell. Didn't I tell you? The Vajrayana is unique. And you, especially in the West, intellectuals, you of all should really like this. Because don't you want to go, you know, like anarchism? Don't you want to go beyond, you know, do you want, you want to really, you want to be critical to the critical, isn't it? Modern, modern is, modern, you want to be avant-garde, right? Avant-garde, forward thinking, go beyond the norm, isn't that what you want to do? Oh, well, then, this is it, this is good. So all this needs to be, I think, explained. Okay. If you are somebody's root guru, would you abuse your students sexually, physically, or emotionally? <laughs> if I'm a Mahasiddha, And if my doing this, if, if I'm a Mahasiddha, and if I'm my doing any of these categories, what, sexually, physically, what, whatever, if this is going to benefit this sentient being, yes, I will do it. No doubt, not even blink, I will do it. If I don't do it, I'm not compassionate. If I'm not a Mahasiddha. And obviously, I'm not a Mahasiddha. Me, this one, I'm not. So me, I'm this, as I told you many times, ignorant being, defiled being. What was the question? What do I do? <laughs> if you're somebody's root guru, would you abuse your students sexually, physically, or emotionally? No, because I have agendas. You know, I want to have a good reputation, you know. I want to be respected. I, I don't want to lose my students. Although recently, you know, my reputation is sort of going down. <laughs> I have to be a little bit careful here. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I want, because I'm smart, you know. Either you are, if you are a Mahasiddha, then you will do this out of compassion. If you are mad lunatic, you will do it because you are mad and lunatic. But I don't think I'm yet a mad. I don't think so. But we never know. You know who, what happens. 
But so, someone who is ambitious, someone who, you know, wants to have the attention of the people, someone who wants, you know, I like it when there's so many thumbs up in my Instagram. <laughs> you understand? Oh, how many counts of this? You understand? And I get, I get so hurt when, <laughs> when people misinterpret my two-word message on my Facebook. So, uh, you know, I get hurt. So I'm like that kind of person. So no, 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 I will not. I will not abuse sexually, whatever, you know, physically. And this is what I tell so-called my students. Okay, I'm about to give you initiation. It just happened yesterday, by the way. I'm about to give you initiations. Initiation is a big deal. I will tell you I'm not a Mahasandhi, Mahasiddha. I'm not enlightened. Chances of me abusing is very, you know, I don't think so. I don't think I will consciously do it because I love my own, you know, friends and reputations and attention and all of that, I told you. I don't think I will do it. I don't think I will do it. But I have told my students, but if you want to receive my teachings, you, your attitude, your motivation should not be Oh, no, no, he's okay, he's a sober. I don't think he will, he will do any of those sort. Using that and receive the teachings, wrong, wrong motivation. If you want to receive initiation from me, a Vajrayana initiation, which, by the way, I will not suggest, you know, don't receive any Vajrayana teachings, but let's say somebody wants to receive a Vajrayana te teachings, Vajrayana initiation from me, you have to come with a total preparation, anything can happen. You have to, you know, that's the tantric way. You can't have a one feet on sort of a samsaric security, what do you call it, secure insurance, you know, grounded, and the another feet on the nirvana. You, you know, you can't have both. You, you know, you, you know, if you want to get <laughs> what the realization, you have to be prepared to get rid of this. You know what, I think the fundamentally, I, this is also one of the mistakes I think that we, the teachers, are making. I think, and especially, you know, I've forgotten to tell you this. On one side, the Tibetan lamas insisting on Tibetan culture, and really not understanding the Western mind and giving teaching. On the other side, now there are many, many modern teachers, modern Western teachers also, whose teachings are firmly rooted on the samsara, both feet. It would have been even slightly better if one feet is sort of tempting to go to the, you know, nirvana. But all the mindfulness, blah, 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 this ethic, all firmly rooted on the samsara, doing the right thing, all of that. Between these two, I think Buddhism will die. And that's so sad. And you should not let that happen. Okay. If the Vajrayana requires a student to obey a guru completely, does the guru have the right to beat and punch students? Yeah, you know, this, I appreciate this question because this is the result of the misinterpretation, partial information of the Vajrayana teaching. I would love to, people to he discuss about, instead of the rights of the guru beating students, the responsibility of the Guru, much more important. His responsibility, his or her responsibility of the student, their enlightenment, primarily, is the paramount. If his, the Guru's action even damages, even a little bit, the seed 
of bodhicitta, pure perception, guru devotion, guru will have to take the responsibility far more than the student because he should know better. Okay? So how should gurus and lamas behave? How should gurus and lamas behave? I think I have already sort of answered this. Outwardly, you know, Sharvakayana would be good, you know, all that, and then? How should students behave? Hmm. That's an interesting question for me. Especially the older students. And this, you know, I will tell, share, you, share you my own experience. You know, I have a lot of Bhutanese students. They annoy me sometimes. I hope the Bhutanese are listening here. You know, it, this will get into the Bhutanese. Sometimes, without, you know, they're being, they're being, you know, their intention is good, I should say. But they worship me so much. They hold my socks, they hold my shoelace. You know, they, you know, they, they create all this. So I think, you know, in detail, I think there was a very good question Janine asked yesterday. I forgot now. Um, how was the question phrased? Would you like to question again? Whoa. Oh, on? Okay. Yeah. If I am your student, Rimshe, I've received initiation from you, and I want to see, I want to practice seeing you purely. But then a girl comes to me and says, so, uh, Zong, Zong Zakens Rimshe just tried to kiss me. I think he might rape me. How do I respond to that girl? Mm. See, this is an interesting, you know, a, a, a very good example. And my answer is this. Let's say I'm readily available somewhere. You should tell me the situation. And if I'm good, I should tell you, yes, go and tell her, Zonza Kinsirin Buchi is an idiot. You understand what I'm saying? This is what you should say, especially if she is new, her aspiration to practice the Dharma is just blossoming. If she is just entering into the world of the Dharma, you don't want to burn that. You should tell her. Now, if I'm not readily available, let's say I'm somewhere in the mountain, Jupiter, whatever, then you should with the right motivation of not wanting to harm this poor being, you should say, it's also considered which is an idiot. You should, you know, you should not go close to him. And then later, if you have the chance, you can tell, you can report to me, saying, hey, Rinpoche, you know, I've told him this. And if I'm good, I said, oh, good, well done. You, you have done a good job. That's what I would say. Okay, maybe one more question and then we will end here. I'm sorry this has been so long for you. Okay. So we hear you'll be an advisor to the new Rigpa Vision Board. Some say you'll just keep business as usual going. How will you engage and what will you advise? I think I've already done a little bit this morning. I mean, you know, study. I would really, really emphasize this. Create the study situation. Create the analytical si situation. And then from there, we can go. And um, yes, you know,
we have to think about the Buddha Dharma. That's really important. The world needs the Buddha Dharma. The world need to hear dependent arising. The world needs wisdom such as non-duality. Buddha Dharma has that. You know, it's Buddha Dharma has been tested for 2,500 years, not by just some dropouts and hippies and dippies, but you know, by many, many, many people, kings, queens, university people. It's, so it's a very sophisticated system. This need to be protected. Now I'm really, you know, to me, I, I see this situation as something positive. People, you know, this doubt and this hurt and this doubt and this speculation that comes to you, please take advantage of, take this chance and try to go forward and try to protect the Buddha Dharma. This is what we need. And if you do that, I think it would, it would you know, turning the uns unfavorable circumstance into circum uh, favorable circumstance. Another Vajrayana unique quality. <laughs> With this note, I think, um, I'm, I'm sorry this has been so long, but um, I hope this has at least stirred up your mind a little bit. And um, please um, be open and be compassionate and uh, be, you know, think big picture and yes, because especially those who have taken the Bodhisattva vow, you know, you have to think big. Um, some obstacles here and there, we need to, our attitude should be obstacles, let's face the obstacle and go more. That's the attitude. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> the dedication of merit. Through this merit, may all beings attain the omniscient state of enlightenment and conquer the enemy of faults and delusion. May they all be liberated from this ocean of samsara and from its pounding waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. Just as the Bodhisattva Manjushri attained omniscience, and Samantha Bhadra too, all these merits now I dedicate to train and follow in their footsteps, as all the victorious Buddhas of past, present, and future praise dedication as supreme. So now I too dedicate all these sources of merit of mine for all beings to perfect good action. Long life prayer for Zongsa Jamyang Kense Rinpoche. Om Svati, dance of wisdom and love, sovereign of the entire Buddha's teaching, the great Dharma ocean of the transmission and realization of the profound and vast, you have mastered through hearing, reflecting, and meditating. Supreme incarnation, may your aspirations be fulfilled, and may your life and activity be infinite. Prayer for the propagation of the teachings of the Kensei lineage. May the tradition of Jaman Kensei Wangpo, who is master of the ocean-like Rime teaching of Tibet, the Lord who wields the wonderful seven special direct blessings, and Manjushri himself in person, spread, prosper, and grow. The prayer to Guru Mpche for removing obstacles and fulfilling wishes. Embodiment of the Buddha's past, present, and future, Guru Rinpoche, master of all cities, guru of great bliss, Dispeller of all obstacles, wrathful subjugator of Maras, to you I pray, inspire me with your blessings, so that outer, inner, and secret obstacles are dispelled, and all my aspirations are spontaneously fulfilled. Om ma hum benza guru pema siddhi hum. Prayer for the tradition of Guru Padmasambhava. May the living tradition of Guru Padmasambhava, Bodhisattva Shantarakshita, and the Dharma King Trison Detson spread throughout the world in all directions. May the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha be present in the minds of all, 
inseparably at all times, bringing peace, happiness, and well-being. Um, a very large and big and heartfelt thank you um, to all questions you answered, all points you addressed, and I believe there will be many more points and questions which have risen just now. Um, however, uh, we clearly heard your call for study and a critical, open, investigative mind, and um, me standing here as someone who helps running the center, um, I will make sure we will put this into action. And maybe in some time more things come up. Um, maybe you're ready to come back and help and support us further. And um, until then we pray that all your vision may be magically fulfilled and that you live very long. Thank you. <laughs>